Good morning. Good morning and, and welcome to our Constitution Week presentation, Constitution Day, uh, officially having been on September 17th. Uh, so we're making this Constitution Week. Uh, I'm quoting. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When those words were first published in, 19, in 1776, they resounded throughout the world, and they still ring loudly today. They formed the egalitarian basis for the Constitution that was to follow 11 years later, and the Republican government that it established. Of course, when Jefferson wrote the words, all men are created equal, he could not have been talking literally. He could not have included, for example, the hundreds of African-American slaves that he personally owned, or the thousands that were owned across the colony. There was no pursuit of happiness for those folks. And as Dred Scott bluntly explained decades later, our founders did not perceive the black man to be the white's equal. On the other hand, in a quite very different sense, Jefferson surely did intend a literal meaning when he said, all men are created equal. Because I'm sure he gave nary a thought to including women in the collective men. Indeed, women enjoyed neither political, nor property, nor social rights at our founding and their pursuit of happiness was essentially defined by their husbands. Boy, that's changed. Uh, <laughs> while the post-Civil War amendments accorded African Americans citizenship and the right to vote and equality, at least on a constitutional level, those amendments did nothing for women. The Supreme Court, from the beginning, refused to apply the Equal Protection Clause to accord women the right to vote, the right to join the bar, and as late as 1948, even the right to work in bars. The 19th Amendment in 1920 finally won women the right to vote, but meaningful social, economic, and legal equality did not ensue quickly. It was not until, in fact, the 1970s that the Supreme Court used the Equal Protection Clause to invalidate any sex classifications, and then it did so only fitfully and grudgingly. Today, of course, women have made progress, but issues of gender discrimi discrimination persist, albeit in more complex and subtle forms. I'm sure that all of you here know today's speaker, you know her, of course, as our super dean. But feminist scholars across this country also know her as a knowledgeable, thoughtful, and sensitive commentators on issues relating to the intersection of gender with the law, the legal system, and the Constitution. Since beginning her academic career as a clinical fellow at Georgetown, continuing through a tenure at the City University of New York, and a year at the University of Maryland School of Law. And since joining the faculty here at West Virginia University in 1995, Dean McConnell has studied, taught, written, and crusaded extensively about the law's impact on matters of women's health, domestic violence, and children and families, and has consistently done so with a keen intelligence and a sincere compassion. Among the many awards she has received recognizing her significant academic and professional accomplishments, she can count among them West Virginia University's Mary Catherine Buswell Award for Outstanding Service to Further Equality of Opportunity for and Achievement of Women. And in 1998, she was awarded the very first annual Women's Award by uh, the College of Law's Women's Law Caucus. Oh, and by the way, she has also along the way become an expert and an activist on issues of land use, land conservation, and natural resources, and all of that besides being our super dean. We are delighted that she has agreed to address us on this Constitution Week, 
on the history of women and our Constitution. I present you with great pleasure the William J. Mayer, Jr., Dean, and the Thomas R. Goodwin Professor of Law, Joyce McConnell. Thank you very, very much for being here today to celebrate the Constitution. I'm very, very pleased to be here with you. Good afternoon. The title of today's talk is Remember the Ladies, the History of Women and the Constitution. I am delighted and truly honored to be asked to deliver the 2012 Constitution Day Lecture. For good or ill, Associate Dean LaFasso prevailed upon me to share with you a lecture that I gave at the Simon Perry Center for Constitutional Democracy at Marshall University in the spring of 2012. My presence here today shows that you can talk me into anything if you ask me enough in advance. <laughs> Remember that. Since 2004, the College of Law has provided a Constitution Day lecture to fulfill the university's responsibility to observe Constitution Day as established by our very own Senator Byrd. <clears throat> Senator Byrd who said, our ideals of freedom set forth and realized in our Constitution are our greatest export to the world. He believed that all citizens should know that on September 17, 1787, which this year is 225 years ago, the Founding Fathers signed the most influential document in American history the United States Constitution. This document established the framework of our government and the rights and freedoms that we, the people, enjoy today. I was here when Senator Byrd first started Constitution Day, and I will always remember that when Senator Byrd appeared anywhere, he always had a copy of the Constitution in his pocket, and he would whip it out at any moment and use it for more than a prop. He deeply believed in the Constitution. It's my great honor to follow his legacy in talking to you today about this amazing document. I'm honored to speak today in the company of so many colleagues, friends, and students on a topic of great importance, the history of women and the U.S. Constitution. Now, a bit of a disclaimer is important here because of the audience. This is not a lecture on the substantive law itself, nor on constitutional legal theory. It's about history. As such, it traces the 236-year journey of women and the Constitution, starting with Abigail Adams and ending with the current Supreme Court. The historical story I'm about to tell according to constitutional historians, have three significant chapters. One, chapter one, constitutional neglect and silence. Chapter two, active exclusion and protection. And chapter three, long-term interpretive struggle for rights and equality. Now, this is always the test, right? Can you make it change? There we go. Remember the ladies, and there you see a young Abigail Adams. Chapter one, the, the period of constitutional neglect and silence, begins with Abigail Adams, with her now famous letter of 1776, the year of the Declaration of Independence. Abigail Adams urged her husband, John, while he served as the Massachusetts representative to the Continental Congress and later to become the second president of the United States, she wrote, remember the ladies. In these three words, she previewed the struggle of the history of women and the Constitution. Abigail and John had a marriage of deep affection and while she was very smart and able, she was a woman of her times and did not participate 
in public political decision making. But her husband did. So on March 31st, 1776, she wrote, In the new code of laws, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. We will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Playfully dismissive, and these are copies of the letters I thought you would be interested in seeing. Playfully dismissive, he responded on April 14, 1776, I cannot but laugh. We have been told that our struggle has loosened the bonds of government everywhere, that children and apprentices were disobedient, that schools and colleges were grown turbulent, that Indians slighted their guardians and Negroes grew insolent to their masters. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, more numerous and powerful than all the rest, were grown discontented. Depend upon it. We know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Although they are in full force, you know they are little more than theory. We dare not exert, exert our power in its full latitude. We are obliged to go fair and softly, and in practice, you know, we are the subjects. We have only the name of masters, and rather than give up this, which would completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoat, I hope General Washington and all of his brave heroes will fight. As you can see, John Adams was making an argument that we continue to hear today. He referred to it as the despotism of the petticoat. But he was, in fact, quite against expanding the franchise beyond propertied white men, and he expressed this in a letter on May 26, 1776, to his friend James Sullivan. It is dangerous to alter the qualifications of voters. There will be no end of it. New claims will arise. Oh, here we go. New claims will arise. Women will demand a vote. Lads from 12 to 21 will think their rights not attended to. And every man who is not a farthing will demand an equal voice with any other in all acts of state. Famous constitutional historian Richard Morris wrote, a prime and still evolving portion of the history of the U.S. Constitution and a cause for celebration is the story of extension through amendment, judicial interpretation and practice of constitutional rights and protections to once ignored or excluded people, to humans who were once held in bondage, to men without property, to the original inhabitants of the land that became the United States, and to women. Other than bills of attainder, searches and seizures, clearly rights of the free individual, women were not included in the Constitution. The word he, other than in these limited circumstances, did not, absolutely did not include she. There was no mention of equal or equality in the Constitution, drafted in 1787, or the First Amendments, Ten Amendments, ratified in 1791, composing the Bill of Rights. Many constitutional historians have speculated about what explains the absence of any reference to equality in the original U.S. Constitution. They speculate because equality was quite dominant in the contemporaneous French Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1789, which declared in Article I, men are born free and remain free and equal in rights. Law must be the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. To compound the question, why did the 18th century U.S. Constitution fail to incorporate the 1776 Declaration of Independence, which declared in ringing tones, and which I will repeat, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, 
that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. A partial answer, of course, is the existence of slavery in all but five of the 13 states of the United States when our nation was new. But the actual reason is more encompassing. Concerning women, listen to the words of Thomas Jefferson, principal author of the Declaration of Independence and later third president of the United States. In 1816, Jefferson said, Were our state a pure democracy, there would yet be excluded from our deliberations women, who to prevent deprivation of morals and ambiguity of issues should not mix promiscuously in the public meetings of men. Thus, equality was not woven into the constitutional fabric. In fact, it was not until 1868, 81 years after the Constitution was ratified, and after the Civil War ended slavery, that the United States provided in the 14th Amendment, as it has ever since, that no state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Equality, and not foremost their own, had been of deep concern and the focus of much action on the part of women. Women were a important, essential activists in the abolition movement and the movement for racial equality. From the founding of the country, women were at the forefront of the anti-slavery movement, and they were leaders in the abolition movement. But while the 14th Amendment granted freedom to all African Americans, men and women, the 15th Amendment granted the franchise only to African-American men, thus continuing to exclude all women, African-American, white, Native American, any woman from the franchise. We now begin Chapter 2, Active Exclusion and Protection. It took more than 50 years of struggle for women to win the right to vote with the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Remember Jefferson's statement about women. It was more than 100 years later that women earned the right to vote. More than anyone in this audience, more than 92 years of age, was alive before women could vote. My mother was born only eight years after women earned the right to vote. In the meantime, the U.S. Supreme Court began a period of seeking to protect women in keeping with Jefferson's explicit philosophy. For most laws that differentiated on the basis of sex, in contrast to obviously odious race-based laws, did so ostensibly to shield or favor the sex regarded as fairer but weaker and dependent. Laws prescribing the maximum number of hours or the times of day women could work or the minimum wages they could receive. Laws barred females from hazardous or inappropriate occupations. For example, lawyering in the 19th century was considered far beyond what women morally should participate in. Move fast forward to the mid 20th century, women could not be bartenders. Remnants of the common law regime which denied to married women rights to hold and manage property continued to exist, to sue or be sued in their own names, or to get credit from a financial institution, thus, of course, saving them from the folly of their own misjudgment. The head and master rule that long held sway in community property states vesting in husbands sole control of community assets all these prescriptions and proscriptions were premised on the notion that women could not cope with the world beyond hearth and home without a father, a husband, a big brother, an uncle, a grandfather, some male relative upon which they could lean. The Supreme Court said in 1908, a woman would fall prey, quote, 
to the greed as well as the passion of man. Cases of the kind I just described placed a spotlight on the burdensome nature of legislation that confined women to a separate sphere. By enshrining and promoting the woman's natural role as selfless homemaker and correspondingly emphasizing the man's role as provider, the state impeded both men and women from pursuit of the very opportunities and styles of life that could enable them to break away from traditional patterns and develop their full human capacities. But this would not begin to change for another 100 years. These are some wonderful, you've been looking at this one for a long time, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Women bring all voters in the world. Let women vote. Vote for women. We demand the vote this session. And of course, one of the leaders, Susan B. Anthony. And while we've been going through these fabulous slides, I want to thank Stuart Klein, actually, for her archival support in helping me pull all of these. These were not easy to find. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, in the Declaration of Sentiments in 1848, predicted that without an explicit grant of equality, there would be none for women. Even though women had the right to vote in 1920, women were still not full citizens. They could not be tried by a jury of their peers. They were excluded from jury service on the basis of their sex. Remember, this was one of Abigail Adams' points and concerns for women in 1776. It was almost 200 years after Abigail Adams asked John to remember the ladies was not until 1970, 50 years after women earned the right to vote, that all obstacles were removed for women to serve on juries. 1970, for those of you who are trying to keep track, was one year before I graduated from high school. With that background in mind, I will now share a Florida case that found its way to the United States Supreme Court in 1961. In 1957, only 55 years ago, Gwendolyn Hoyt stood trial for murdering her husband. Today, we would consider her a victim of domestic violence, a woman who acted in self-defense. When she was tried, Florida placed no women on the jury rolls out of concern for women's place at the center of home and family life. To put this in perspective, almost 80 years earlier, in 1880, the West Virginia Supreme Court of OP Appeals overturned a murder conviction, holding that the exclusion of African American men from the jury was unconstitutional. West Virginia women could not sit on juries until 1956, two years after I was born. With the exclusion of women from Gwendolyn Hoyt's jur uh, jury, she was convicted of second-degree murder by an all-male jury. She appealed to the United States Supreme Court, arguing that she was convicted without a jury of her peers. The Supreme Court in 1961 rejected her plea. The court, following an unbroken line of precedent, used a separate spheres argument. The notion that it was a man's lot, because of his nature, to be the breadwinner, the head of household, the representative of the family outside the home. And it was woman's lot because of her nature to bear and raise children and keep the house in order. And that was sufficient to make sure that she could not sit on a jury. Three years after women won the right to vote, the Equal Rights Amendment was introduced in Congress by Republican Senator Curtis and Representative Anthony, who happened to be the nephew of suffragist Susan B. Anthony. The Equal Rights Amendment was authored by Alice Paul, head of the National Women's Party, who led the suffrage campaign. Equality of the rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So this was in 1923. 
From 1923 to 1972, the amendment was introduced into each session of Congress. In 1972, it passed both houses. A huge campaign developed against the ERA. A decade later, it fell short of ratification by three states. Chapter 3, we begin the long-term interpretive struggle for rights and equality. United States Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, leader of the struggle in the courts for an end to odious racial classifications, said prior to his 1991 retirement as a Supreme Court Justice that he did not celebrate what the Constitution was in the beginning as originally framed. The Constitution had protected the slave trade until 1808, and it required the return of persons who had escaped from human bondage, a provision in force until the Civil War. Instead, he celebrated, he said he celebrated how our fundamental instrument of government had evolved over the span of two centuries. The true miracle, he said, is the Constitution's life nurtured through two turbulent centuries. It is this constitutional life that many constitutional scholars share. Others suggest that the equal dignity of individuals is part of the U.S. constitutional legacy, shaped by the original framers. Yet others argue that there is no overarching theme of equality in the Constitution, and that equality must come through amendment or congressional action that is constitutional. Some would argue that the culture of the founders impeded their ability to act or to perceive or to see any need for equality for women. To quote Justice Ginsburg, ideals of human equality and rights and opportunities and of individual freedom to aspire and achieve are the ideals that we want to see protected in the Constitution. But as she points out, they stated their commitment in the Declaration of Independence to equality and in the Declaration, the Bill of Rights to Individual Liberty. Those commitments, she said, had growth potential. They received further expression in the 19th century, after the Civil War ended slavery, through the addition of the Equal Protection Clause to the Constitution, and again in the 20th century, when women were made voting citizens. The period of constitutional interpretation for gender equality and a push for a constitutional amendment to guarantee gender equality starts about 10 years after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, the year I was born. Here, the vibrant idea of the equal stature and dignity of men and women as a matter of constitutional principle began to have traction. At the same time, a very important biotech revolution was beginning to happen. And birth control, for the first time in women's history, was becoming widely available. Women could prevent pregnancy and more easily participate in the workplace and in the public sphere generally. Two birth control cases in the 1960s and 70s hit the United States Supreme Court and began to pry open the notion of equality. In 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut, the court struck down a Connecticut law prohibiting the use of contraceptives by a married couple finding that it violated the right to marital privacy. While the Bill of Rights does not explicitly mention privacy, Justice William Douglas wrote for the majority that the right was to be found in the penumbras and emanations of other constitutional protections. Justice Arthur Goldberg wrote a concurring opinion in which he used the Ninth Amendment to defend the Supreme Court's ruling. Justice John Marshall Harlan wrote a concurring opinion in which he argued that privacy is protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Justice Byron White also wrote a concurrence based on the Due Process Clause. Two justices, Hugo Black and Potter Stewart, filed dissents. 
Justice Black argued that the right to privacy is to be found nowhere in the Constitution. Justice Stewart famously called the Connecticut statute an uncommonly silly law, but argued that it was constitutional. Seven years later, in 1972, in Eisenstadt versus Baird, the right to privacy extended to the use of contraception by unmarried couples. I would assume this right is something that's quite celebrated by everyone in the audience today. <laughs> Thus, the right to use... And remember, 1972 is a year after I graduated from high school. <laughs> I, too, celebrate Eisenstadt versus Bear. The right to privacy extended to the use of contraception by unmarried couples. Thus, the right to use birth control is now a mere 40 years old. For many, 40 years seems like a long time, but in constitutional history it is recent and perhaps fragile, a right that could disappear if current justices were to adopt the reasoning adopted by Stewart in Griswold versus Connecticut and by Black. Against this social and legal backdrop, the turning point case in sex-based equal protection is considered to be Reed versus Reed in 1971. It was brought by a young lawyer and law professor, now Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The case decided in 1971 involved Richard Lynn Reed, a teenage boy from Idaho who died under tragic circumstances. His parents were long separated, and while he was young, during his tender years, the court awarded his mother, Sally Reed, custody. However, when Richard became a teenager, the court gave custody to his father, Cecil, to prepare Richard for his manhood years. The boy fell in with a bad crowd and spent some time in a corrections facility where he was released to his father's custody. He was deeply depressed and committed suicide using his father's gun. Sally Reed, the mother, sought to take charge of her son's few belongings, applied to the court to be administrator of Richard's estate. The father, some days later, applied for the same appointment. The Idaho court turned down Sally Reed's application, although it was first in time, and appointed the father under a state statute that read, as between persons equally entitled to administer a decedent's estate, males must be preferred to females. Sally Reed was not a sophisticated woman. She earned her living by caring for elderly people, taking them into her home. She probably did not think of herself as a feminist, but she had the strong sense that her state's law was unjust. The Supreme Court unanimously declared Idaho's male preference statute unconstitutional in denying Sally Reed the equal protection of Idaho's law. And I love this slide. It's a memorial to Sally Reed, just at the house, simple house where she lived, just memorializing what she had done for equal protection. Two years later, in 1973, Arising from the privacy doctrine established in Griswold and expanded in Eisenstadt, the court did not decided perhaps the most well-known case in the last four decades, Roe versus Wade. And a less recognized equal protection case, Frontiero versus Richardson. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, again, appears, representing Air Force Lieutenant Sharon Frontiero, and successfully challenged as a denial of equal protection the military's policy of denying women housing and medical benefits covering their husbands that were granted to males for their wives. Lieutenant Frontiero had this clear view. She saw the laws in question as plain denials of equal pay, and the court agreed. And here's, this is a wonderful cartoon, and you probably can't see it, but it's it's a wonderful little parody of what was going on in court at the time. 
Roe v. Wade, 1973, held that the right to privacy under the Due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment extends to a woman's decision to terminate a pregnancy, but that right must be balanced against the state's two legitimate interests for regulating abortions, protecting prenatal life and protecting the woman's health. Saying that these straight state interests become stronger over the course of a pregnancy, the court resolved this balancing test by tying state regulation of abortion to the woman's current trimester of pregnancy. And here you can see so one of the very early posters from Roe uh, during the Roe period, my mind, my body, my choice. What you may not know is one of our very own graduates, Toby Ann Schwartz, was actually involved in the companion case to Roe versus Wade, which was a Georgia case, Doe versus Bolton. Toby Ann Schwartz was a graduate of our law school in 1959. She was a legal aid attorney in Atlanta. She served as co-counsel for Doe versus Bolden, the companion and landmark abortion rights case overturning the abortion law of Georgia. The court's decision was released January 22, 1973, the same day as Roe versus Wade. What I'd like to show you now are a series of slides that capture this period of time. You begin to see safe legal abortions for all women. This led to a very hearty response from the pro-life movement, and you begin to see a different scenario, which still continues to be play out today, starting out with activism for choice, and showing activism for the defense of life. And these posters, I am the pro-life generation. Women of the same age keep abortion legal. In 1975, two years later in Stanton versus Stanton, the court declared unconstitutional a state law allowing a parent to stop supporting a daughter once she reached the age of 18, but requiring parental support for a son until he turned 21. I love the, the sort of paradox in that. That same year, the court decided another equal protection case brought by Ginsburg. It began in 1972 when Paula Weissenfeld, a New Jersey public school teacher, died in childbirth. Her husband, Stephen, sought to care for the baby, boy, personally, but was denied child in care social security benefits, then available only to widowed mothers, but not to widowed fathers. He won a unanimous judgment in the Supreme Court in defense of the sex-based differential. The government had argued that the distinction was entirely rational because widows as a class are more in need of financial assistance than are widowers. True in general, the court acknowledged, but laws reflecting the situation of the average woman or the average man were no longer good enough. Many widows in the United States had not been dependent on their husband's earnings, the court pointed out, and a still small but growing number of fathers, like Stephen, were willing to care personally for their children. Using sex as a convenient shorthand to substitute for financial need or willingness to bring up a baby did not comply with the equal protection principle as the court had grown to understand it. What caused the court's understanding to dawn and grow? Judges do read the newspapers and are affected not by the weather of the day, as distinguished constitutional law professor Paul Freund once said, but by the climate of the era. Supreme Court justices and lower court judges as well were becoming aware of a sea change in United States society. Their enlightenment was advanced publicly by the briefs filed in court and privately, I suspect, by the aspirations of the women in their lives, particularly the daughters and granddaughters in their own families and communities. In the years from 1961 to 1971, women's employment outside the home expanded rapidly. Notice that that parallels the right to use birth control. That expansion was attended by a revived women's equality movement, fueled in part by the movement of the 1960s for racial justice, but also by access to safer methods of controlling birth, longer lifespans, even inflation, 
all were implicated in the social dynamic that yielded this new reality. In the 1970s, for the first time in the nation's history, the average woman in the United States was experiencing most of her adult years in a household not dominated by child care requirements. That development may be, indeed, as Columbia University economics professor Eli Ginsberg described in 1977, the single most outstanding phenomenon of the late 20th century. The erosion of the separate spheres led in 1982 to the court stating in Mississippi University for Women versus Hogan that excluding qualified men from attending a nursing school tends to perpetuate the stereotyped view of nursing as an exclusively woman's job. <clears throat> when Justice O'Connor, in her first year as the first woman on the United States Supreme Court, wrote the decision opening to men the Mississippi University for Women's School for Nurses, she paved the way for the opinion that Justice Ginsburg wrote 14 years later in the Virginia Military Academy case. Indicative of precedent, Justice O'Connor wrote in 1982 for a court that divided five to four, the vote in 1996 in the Virginia Military Academy case was seven to one. With the Chief Justice writing a current concurring opinion in support of the judgment by forcing legislative and executive reexamination re of sex-based classifications, the court helped to ensure that laws and regulations would catch up with the changed world. Thus, Congress in the late 1970s <clears throat> opened the doors of the U.S. military academies, West Point, Annapolis, the Air Force Academy to women. When the court issued its opinion in U.S. versus Virginia, the VMI, VMI case in 1996, with only one dissenting opinion, it held under the Constitution's equal protection principle, the Commonwealth of Virginia could not exclude from a public military college the VMI women who wished to attend and could meet the entrance requirements. The VMI decision by the time of the Virginia Military Academy case, by the time this decision was decided, women cadets had graduated at the top of every class at the U.S. academies for over a decade. Now for the end of our story. To quote Justice Ginsburg, the evolution of the Constitution and gender equality makes it possible for our daughters, as well as our sons, to aspire and achieve according to their individual talent and capacities. But as I mentioned earlier, we cannot take this evolution for granted. In 2011, Justice Scalia gave an interview published in California Lawyer, in which he says that the Constitution does not protect against discrimination based on gender. Put in the context of the fragility of gender equality in the Constitution, he may be correct. If he is, I leave you with this question. If the Constitution does not guarantee gender equality, is a constitutional amendment a necessity? Thank you very, very much for being here this morning. We, I believe we can take questions if anyone has them. And then I might have to defer to the other constitutional scholars in the room. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Well, I, th I think what's happened is the despotism of the petticoats. Right? <laughs> I think it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to be able to share Constitution Day together and to take one particular glimpse at one particular uh, category of person who happens to make up 50 percent 
um, of the population and to see how that particular one half of the population has been treated in the Constitution. Of course, there's so much more I could have said or would have liked to have said, but I know that I've gone on already for 45 minutes, and that's long enough for anyone to have to sit and listen. Yes. Well, it's really a, an interesting question. There's a lot that's been written lately, both on the glass ceiling in corporate boardrooms and in law practice, and also then on uh, that uh, very well-known Atlantic article now on whether well, women can still have it all, um, the idea being that there are many uh, conditions in the workplace that might make it harder to be a woman because of a woman's role in the family. Um, and th these are topics that are just very hotly debated, and I don't have any predictions about where women will be. I think, however, and this is by dint of my personality, I just happen to be an optimist. And even though it's taken 225 years to be where we are today, we are here today in a much better position than we were. And change is slow. If there's one message I really wanted to deliver today, much beyond the substance, is that the equality for women has been extraordinarily recent. And it's something that we try to talk about a lot in my gender and law seminar. I, I use myself as an example for two reasons, because I'm living proof, and you don't think of me as being a person who existed during a time of inequality. But I like to use two examples. One is that I went to high school and graduated from high school pre-Title um, IX, and there were no women's sports in my public schools at all, none. And that has changed hugely and I think has made an extraordinary difference in women's self-confidence and understanding of teams and participation in the public world. The second example I like to use is that when I looked for my first job in 1971, I looked in the Washington Post and in the Washington Post classifieds there was a men's section and there was a women's section and you couldn't, if you were a woman, you could not apply for the men's jobs. And so I use those two examples to try to illustrate for those of you who want to remain optimism, optimistic along with me, that that's extraordinary progress in the fabric of a society and extraordinary progress in terms of the law. What I think is the strongest predictor of whether we'll continue to advance inequality is whether we continue to talk about it as a goal and can you continue to accept that we have some responsibility for continuing to make it a goal. Rights are never finally secured. Rights are something that you continue to work on always um, to protect. And I believe, I wouldn't be surprised knowing you if you didn't end up in the corporate boardroom. And when you do, I'll be coming to you for a very large check. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that moment. <laughs> um, I do, one thing I do want to say, though, is that um, it is very important that women continue to try to put themselves into positions of leadership, and that's something that we really work on at the law school, and I, I want to continue to work on that because I think it, ta it takes a lot to try to put yourself in those positions. As I was listening to your talk, I was struck by what a happy accident it was for me to have been born in 1970 um, <laughs> because as you describe the rights that women have acquired in the last 40 years, I realized that I have never lived without those rights. In fact, they've come along just in time for me to take advantage of them. And uh, very courteous of them. And, but what I also realize is how much I take those rights for granted. And I can intellectually remind myself that those were not always guaranteed. But it's difficult for me, um, and probably for many of my generation and behind me, um, to always feel viscerally the importance of working for equal rights for women because we've had so many rights for our entire lifetime. And I'm wondering whether you can address me personally and anyone else here of my generation or younger, 
um, how you, um, in your experience and your, in your scholarly experience, um, would inform your advice to us about how to move this forward in our consciousness and in our emotional experience when many of these struggles um, we have not faced personally? Oh, it's such a great question. One, one way I think that is very helpful is to talk to women who didn't have them. Um, one of the, it, whether you are um, pro-choice or pro-life, I'll share this anecdote with you because it's always been very profound for me in thinking about um, the, the right to a legal abortion, and that was that my mother was a nurse um, during a time when it was unlawful. And my mother is deeply, deeply committed to the right to a safe and legal abortion for women. And when you ask her why, she becomes absolutely impassioned about it because she saw so many women die in emergency rooms from botched unlawful abortions. She feels very, very strongly about it. So I think one thing that I think is very important is talking to women who had experiences prior so that we do understand the significance of what some of this means. Um, I also think having a day like this where we look at it collectively is actually very important because no matter w whether you agree or not with certain specific decisions by the court, it is um, something that this rapid transformation toward equality is something that has almost happened in a hidden, people just take it for granted, as you've said. And talking about it and writing about it and reading about it and sharing experiences, I think, go a long way to helping people realize how recent it was. Um, it, for most people in this room, most people in this room were probably born around 1986, Maybe, maybe a little bit later. Um, and so this seems like really ancient history. And I think that um, we don't talk enough, for example, about the struggle that it took to get where we are. And we've almost made it invisible, and you're confirming that. And so I think public discussion will go a really long way to raise consciousness about how recent, and as I say throughout my talk, how fragile the rights are. That's, and that's something that I, I think many people, maybe born after 1970, might think this is the way it's always been, this is the way it will always be. But there's no reason to believe it will always be this way. These things can get eroded very quickly. Um, I don't know that I've answered your question, but I really do believe the di public dialogue is very important. Other questions? Uh, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and the women's movement here, and in the anti-apartheid movement, there were not so many, but numbers of prominent whites who were part of the ANC, like Nadine Gordimer or others. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about why there are so few prominent men in the women's movement. I mean, why you see so few, even us girly men, aren't really the poets up there. among you. Right? You know? <laughs> Well, I think that's interesting. I think during just in historical context in the 60s and 70s when there was a much more public fight for women's rights, um, there were a lot of very important men involved. Um, and they actually consciously um, chose not to be the spokespeople and the leaders um, as a way of allowing women to gain prominence in leadership in their own movement. Um, and so if you, you know, if you were to go back into records of many of the active nonprofits, you would see that there were actually very many men involved in the women's rights movement early on. Um, I can't speak, I'm not a historian, so I can't speak as specifically to the first wave of feminism, which would have been more around the vote, uh, the extent to which men were involved in that activity. Um, but I think it's a very important question. It's a broader question, right, which is 
why don't we all want to stand up for the rights of all of our fellow humans? What, what is it that might hold us back? I think that's a, and, and it's for some reason, and I'm not quite sure I could articulate it today, putting oneself out there and standing up for the rights for another, even when it may not harm you, can be something that makes you tremble, right? The idea of taking on a public role and a public position. Um, I guess what I would say is the lesson from your question is where we really have very little to risk and we can be out there supporting people, the question is why don't we and could we push ourselves harder to do it? And then the second question is even when it's hard, even when it could destroy us or destroy our families, should we be doing it too? What, what the, um, our, as he said, girly man in the front here, um, said was um, it, it could be also that women, that men don't, still don't support equality uh, for women. And I think that that's a, that, that may be true, um, and I'm certain that there are men who don't, but I'm certain that there are many men who do. And I think we have a hard time finding a way to talk about it in a way that makes people feel comfortable. It's a, it's more, it's very threatening for, in, in many ways, because gender is everything, right? Yes. Well, that would be a misperception. Um, <laughs> it's just because our women are so fabulous that they just <laughs> seem to take up a lot more space. Um, the the truth, your question is actually one that I've been giving a tremendous amount of thought to, but there's some um, uh, facts that I, I need to clarify, and that is that you're right, starting in the 1970s, there was a, a ballooning of the number of women going to law school, and in the 1980s and 1990s, we even began to approach, if not achieve, 50 percent. Um, since the 2000s, the percentage of women applying to law school and attending law school has actually declined. Um, so you would see a peak in the late 90s, 2000s uh, at 50 percent um, nationally and at WVU we are at 36 percent. Um, so there's been a 14 percent drop in the number of women applying to and attending law school and I'm deeply concerned about it. I've raised the issue with the president of the American Bar Association this year and have spoken uh, to the Commission on Women for the ABA to see if we might do something nationally. Um, I, after I say this, there's always a follow-up question, which is why do I think that's happening? So let me tell you why I think it's happening. And I think the news is complex. I think there's good news and bad news. The good news is I think what we're seeing is a lot of women um, may have gone in the 70s, 80s, 90s because they didn't perceive that there were a lot of open alternatives to being a professional. Um, and that may have been because they were steered away from science, technology, engineering, and math and didn't follow that pathway. Over the last decade, there's been tremendous attention to the gender gap in those areas and girls in, in school and then all the way up through college are getting tremendous support and guidance to actually choose science, technology, engineering, and math, and not to look at the humanities, which is usually the feeder um, for law school. So I think that's the good news in some ways, right? It means that there are expanded opportunities for women, and women aren't just being channeled into one particular profession. The bad news is I think that many people, not just women, but I think it's having a larger impact on, on women, have been frightened by what they read about the demands of the career. Um, and there's been, a, uh, I believe, a, 
a wrong-headed focus on legal education and law in terms of work-life balance. And I'll tell you why I think that's wrong-headed is because I think whenever you get into professional positions and positions of leadership, which most lawyers do find themselves in those positions, you end up working hard, and it's hard to balance everything. But I don't think that's any different from being a corporate CEO um, or being a CFO or being a woman in another kind of leadership position. And for some reason, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have really focused on law school and not on MBAs and not on physicians and not on the other kinds of careers that women are choosing. Um, so I think there's good news, bad news, but um, I'm very concerned about it, and I love that you asked the question. There was a hand up here. Along, yeah. It's interesting because more what I the, – the reason I asked the question is because, you know, it – it nearly passed, right, and we're only failed by three states. Um, I'm, if you were going to ask me politically, I'm not sure this is the political moment to do it. But really, I wasn't thinking of either of your choices. I was thinking more of protecting what we've already gained from erosion. I mean, you're asking, is there something in the past or something in the future? And I'm sort of looking at right now. <laughs> is, is there anything that could be done that would assure us that there wouldn't be erosion of the rights that have been gained? But thank you for your question. I think we're supposed to end, actually, at 1, and so I've actually kept you here much longer than I should have. I want to thank you all very much for coming today, and there's a reception in the lobby.